When people study psychology and sociology, things like that, uh, they try to get inside the mind and they try to understand how people uh, interact with others, how we think about things. And uh, one of the things that is pretty obvious, you don't have to be a psychologist or a sociologist to know that generally people don't like to be wrong. Uh, whatever, uh, from the time we're young, we establish certain beliefs in our lives. And uh, sometimes during life, we encounter evidence that makes us reconsider those things that we believed, or we get evidence that solidifies those beliefs as well. And oftentimes, it becomes difficult for people to change their beliefs. Like I said, it's, it's not impossible, but people really want to make sure that they are uh, on the right path if they are going to change a belief. Now, uh, uh, I think we see a lot of this in the realms of politics and religion, for instance. Uh, you know, we have certain beliefs and... Uh, especially in religion, since we're in church, that's my focus this morning. For instance, atheists. Say somebody's raised uh, through their young years into a teenager and maybe into young adulthood, and uh, they haven't really given much thought to God. They think, for the most part, he probably doesn't exist. Those people would probably find it difficult to change that belief. All of a sudden, one day I thought there was no God, and now on the next day I think there is a great creator who loves me and all the things that go along with that. Uh, so, but some people just dig in their heels and they refuse to believe in the existence of God. Despite evidence of miracles and natural phenomenon that can't be explained any other way. Now, whatever it is, whatever area it is, uh, you know, when we're speaking of hold, holding our beliefs, that might be difficult to change. I was researching some of this stuff, and I, I honestly thought that this was more of a joke, but this is true. There is a group of people called the Flat Earth Society. They are out there. They have a website if you're interested. And they believe that what much of what NASA uh puts out there for public consumption, and a lot of what is in astronomy textbooks is all a big uh, elaborate hoax. Uh, they do not believe that the Earth is a ball, a sphere, but rather it is flat, hence the name Flat Earth Society. They think it's more like a compact disc or, or, or an old record, okay? So a, a, round, a round circle, but flat, of course. Some members, uh, some people arrive as members of the Flat Earth Society, different ways. Some, some read the Bible and they say, well, it seems here that the Bible's saying it's flat. Other people just look at, say, airplane pilots go up, they see a flat you know, area, hence the world must be flat. So they come about it different ways. And um, they say that that's basically what it must be. Now, uh, I was intrigued by the concept, to, to uh, be honest. Um, I had a lot of questions at the beginning to try to simplify it. They say that rather than the North Pole and the South Pole being at the top and the bottom of the globe, they say the North Pole is in the middle of the record. Okay. And from there, you have the coldest countries like Alaska and Siberia and uh, those, uh, the Northern Hemisphere, what we call. And then from there, it goes out towards the edge of the record. Well, my next question is what keeps all the ocean waters from running off the edge then? Is gravity not a thing in the Flat Earth Society? This is what, how they explain that. They say that Antarctica then surrounds the outer edge of the record. And uh, Antarctica is nothing more than a 150 foot high wall of ice. I don't know that any, how anybody measured that, but I don't want to overthink it, I guess. So that sort of keeps the water in, sort of like the edge of a bowl. That's how they explain it. It was certainly an interesting concept for sure. Um, but no matter what is in textbooks, no matter what's, you know, on the weather, you know, they show a picture of the globe and all that, they just think, they, they reason it away another different, uh, somehow, you know, some other way. Uh, I'm inclined to stick to my trusty globe, okay, uh, for what it's worth. 
And, but it's not just a flat earth society. This happens in all different areas of life. People just don't want to be wrong. They don't want to change. And maybe some of these people honestly think that is the way that the earth is. So hey, I don't want to stand in judgment of them either. I just think that there seems to be an awful lot of evidence to the contrary that is trying to, people are trying to sort of put a, a round peg in a square hole or however they say that. That is sort of an odd maybe intro into the book of Job. And this morning we're going to look at the last of Job's three friends. His name is Bildad. And he actually was the second friend that you are introduced to if you read it from beginning to end. But I did skip him and I mentioned that earlier when we looked at his third friend. Uh, they sort of take turns and then Job answers each of them and then the first goes again and the second goes again and so forth. So they keep this pattern. And um, what Bildad said later on to me was a little more meaningful and significant. So that's why we're hitting at him now. And we find it in chapter 25. It's a very short chapter. I did make a mistake in the bulletin. It doesn't go to verse 16. There's only six verses in this chapter. What Bildad says is very brief. And so we'll read in chapter 25 from verses 1 through 6. If you're following in your pew Bible, looks like it's on page 373. And we'll read those six verses of Job 25. Then Bildad the Shuhite replied, Dominion and all belong to God. He establishes order in the heights of heaven. Can his forces be numbered? Upon whom does his light not rise? How then can a man be righteous before God? How can one born of woman be pure? If even the moon is not bright and the stars are not pure in his eyes, how much less man who is but a maggot, a son of man, who is only a worm. May the Lord's blessing be added to the reading and hearing of his holy word. So, in general, when you read those words of Job's friend Bildad, for the most part, I would typically agree with what he says. I don't think there's any glaring theological misstatements in there. Uh, he says how far God is above us, how much greater God is, and uh, all that's true. God is much greater than us. Um, he says that there's no end to God's forces. I would agree to that hyperbole, but still I agree with it. Um, says about nothing, you know, doesn't receive, or there's nothing that doesn't receive God's light. Talks about man in his fallen state. He's calling us maggots, but that's what he's, he means. And uh, how we're not righteous in and of ourselves before God. Th these are the basic premises that he is setting forth. And uh, I, if you read afterwards, which I just you know, easily cut it off at the chapter break, uh, it seems when you read the rest of what Job says, Job agrees with him too. It's the application is where they, uh, they uh, differ. And um, there is a book that I read maybe a year or two ago uh, by a Christian scientist named Hugh Ross, still alive today. And uh, he makes the claim in this specific book, he's written many books by the way, but he makes a claim that there is evidence for the existence of God in nature. And he specifically looks at outer space. I've always been interested in astronomy, so that made me want to pick up this guy's book and see what he says. By the way, he doesn't talk about the flat earth people at all. Uh, he sticks with scientific fact. Uh, but for example, he says that many, there are many scientific facts that man knew first from the Bible, from God's word, and only later or even relatively recently in some cases, these things have been verified to be true by science. Yet man's known these things for thousands of years. So the thing is, how can that happen if God doesn't exist, if this isn't truly God's word? And that's one of the points that Ross makes in his book. You know, were the people who wrote the Bible just really good guessers? You could argue in, okay, if it happened one little time, okay, you got lucky, but 
time after time after time, there's just so much in there that just boggles the mind, that could not have happened without the existence of God and God's inspiration of the Holy Scriptures. So in his book, he talks about the Big Bang Theory, okay, not the TV show, but the what you're taught back in school. And uh, in school, we're pretty much taught about that. And I'm not going to get into all the weeds with the science because honestly, the book at parts was over my head too, and I consider myself somewhat interested in science and do my best to learn and understand things so this isn't going to be too deep but back in school uh, we are taught that the big bang was the way that the world began and uh, the thing is though and what ross talks about is that we call it the big bang theory technically it's not a theory because a scientific theory must be uh, tested and observed nobody can test the big bang and certainly nobody was there to observe it now, there are reasons why people think that it happened, but people hear, oh, this is a scientific theory, so this means something. And, but anyway, regardless of that, the, we'll call it a theory, we'll give them that much anyway. It says all of a sudden there was some tiny point of singularity, whatever that is, and it got restless and it exploded one day. And then it created all the building blocks of the world as we see today. And uh, honestly, uh, this Christian Hugh Ross believes the Big Bang Theory too. So he's not uh, poking you know, any holes in that story. He's just saying how that points to God. But the way that it's taught in school is without God. They take the God piece out of there. And the problem is when you take the God piece out of there, it falls apart. I mean, what would have happened to make this point of singularity restless and want to explode? Just, you know, they, they don't ever want to talk about that, what set it in motion. Uh, a Christian can look at the Big Bang and say, well, obviously that was God who was outside of that and so forth. Uh, Bildad, in the book, he talks about, uh, Book of Job talks about the moon and the stars and all these things. And it, we are just a lot more knowledgeable about those things than, uh, than they were back then. Naturally, we've had many more years to be studying these things. Yet, atheists, scientists still insist upon cutting out that central part of the equation, cutting out the God piece. Um, back in school, when I was in school, I can tell you, uh, and learning about this, I knew there was a God, I believed in a God, but I wasn't a Christian then, but I knew enough to know that something just doesn't sound right, they're not giving me the whole picture. And so, little did I know that generally speaking, it's actually has, things have changed. I've heard people say, oh, Christians can't believe the Big Bang because it takes God out. Things have completely reversed now because, and I'll explain why, People now realize, and atheists now realize, that you cannot believe the Big Bang Theory unless you believe in a creator, someone outside of that, as I just described, to put it in motion. So now you have Christians believing in the Big Bang Theory, and atheists say that this uh, isn't true at all. Um, they know that it demands a creator. So I thought, okay, well, what I took, dug a little deeper, how do atheists think the world began then? Well, they say that the, uh, the universe is infinite. That's their new way around getting around God. They say it shrinks and then it expands and it shrinks and expands and it's done this all the time. There never was a beginning. To me, that makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, you don't have to be a uh, whatever astronomer to uh, figure that out. But that's what people are writing these days in scientific journals talking about an infinite universe. Makes no sense whatsoever. At least I haven't read anything that thinks it's logical at all. I honestly think it's pretty easy to say it's another effort to cling to their own beliefs about 
the lack of a God, and they do whatever they can to fit their knowledge into their preconceived notions. And oddly, it plays into Bildad's argument in these short little six verses in Job 25. Um, but I'll get to that in a second. Uh, here's another thing. In this book that I read by Hugh Ross, he makes the case that Earth is the only possibly habitable planet of all the planets that scientists have discovered. And I didn't even realize, as of the date of that book, which is probably 10 years ago or something, scientists have discovered over 3,600 different planets. Now we know there's only a handful in our own solar system, but they have all these telescopes and all that out there. And what Ross tells us is of all the possibilities of life, none of them can support life because they're either too hot or too cold. They're either too close to their sun or they're too far away. Earth happens to be that one planet that is perfect for life. We have not discovered another one like Earth. So that makes a person ask some questions. Why would God go through the effort to create 3,600 planets, only one of which can support life? If what Ross says is true, which seems to be. Is God being wasteful? And I don't think he is, and I'll tell you why. Um, we need to realize that man on earth was God's crowning achievement. The Bible doesn't say that the 3,600 planets that God created was his crowning achievement. It was man made in his image. So God prepared of all of these possibilities one special place for his uh, for his uh, man to live. And as we learn more about our world, we should feel the love of God so much more when we think of what God, all the work God went through and he looked through 3,600 plus planets. This is the one that I want my man to live on. This is the perfect one. However, he went about doing that, of course. So Bildad... He's correct about the greatness of God. We serve a God that created over 3,600 planets. And he says the stars number into the billions. And God knows the name of each and every one of them, by the way. But where Bildad's correct about the greatness of God, he's wrong about the application of what he knows about God. He knows God is high above us. I said we should agree with that. But he doesn't allow for a God who makes a way for us to approach him personally. Um, you don't see that anywhere in his words. Uh, verse four, he says, uh, how then can a man be righteous before God? Well, there is a way that we can. We know that now. He just didn't know it back then. And uh, it, interestingly, it was what Job said earlier in his book. He said, truly, I know it is so, but... How can a man be righteous before God? Job was asking the same question, but in a different way. That's where I think Bildad's right and he's wrong at the same time. Uh, he's right because by nature we can't be righteous before him. That's what he was really talking about. But he's also wrong because uh, he doesn't talk about the Redeemer that we talked about uh, last week in chapter 19. Job said, I know my Redeemer lives. Bildad was just sort of ignoring that part of the equation. So Bildad asked this question, and he's probably asking it in a rhetorical way, not expecting a, an answer from Job or anyone else. How can a mortal be righteous by, before God? But we have an answer. And if I would summarize it, the answer is two words, by proxy. And the word proxy is the power of a person authorized to act as a substitute for another. So Jesus is our proxy. That's how we are able to be righteous before God, through Jesus, who is our substitute. That's the simple, you know, one minute uh, explanation to that uh, that question, but there have been volumes among volumes of books that have been written through the years talking about what that means. But back to what Bildad says again, he says man's a maggot, 
Okay, we'll go with that. I would use different words, but a maggot and a worm in relation to God. And without, uh, without Jesus, without someone, you know, as a substitute, spiritually speaking, is probably a good comparison, you know, in our unregenerate state. But uh, unlike Bill Dad, I wouldn't suggest going around calling people maggots and worms just because you don't know God. Not the greatest way to evangelize, uh, for one thing, but uh, Bill Dad tends to just have his personality shines through here. Um, trying to been sort of over the board here to trying to lay some things out uh, to get you to sort of think, maybe expand on these six verses in a way, but pull it together, not so much talking about what Bill Dad says, but how he says it. And when somebody's suffering like Job, there's two sides to a coin. One side's the knowledge of God and knowledge about God. The other side is you have sort of the emotional side, I'll call it. And it's always best to try to strike a balance between the two. Uh, do we always accomplish that? I'm sure we don't, but that should be what we should try to do. See, some people have no knowledge of God and no compassion. Therefore, I basically call them atheists, okay? They don't know God, don't really care that much about other people in the big scheme of things. Okay, and I'm, you, it's a generalization. Then uh, you have people with a lot of compassion, but they have no knowledge of God whatsoever. These are sort of the people that I see out there who sort of say, well, doesn't matter what you do, God accepts you as you are, God made you that way, those kind of things. They're very loving towards people. They want people to feel accepted, but that they're completely wrong about the God part of it. So that's another uh, class of people. Um, you then have people who have knowledge but lack the compassion. And sort of like Bill Daddy, he, he basically what he knew about God was true, but you come off as very harsh and abrasive towards people. And uh, Job didn't need that at that time either. Again, he's trying to recover and understand things and uh, didn't get a lot of compassion from any of his friends. So this kind of person like Bill Dad looks at God as the judge, but not like the compassionate redeemer that he also is, when in fact God is both. So the best scenario is what we don't really see here, and that would be what we should try to achieve, the balance between knowledge of God and compassion. So if somebody's struggling, just tell them how a compassionate God loves them, and if their struggles uh, even if their struggles would be the result of a personal sin, maybe somebody got drunk and got in an accident and now they're recovering. Um, you can also uh, tell them that nothing is above God's ability to forgive too. So you're not saying, oh, it doesn't matter what you did, God's gonna love you anyway, that's not true. So we just try to strike a balance. And we don't excuse things that are wrong either, but encourage repentance and knowledge of God. So when where Job's friends went wrong in many ways, but generally they didn't realize that sometimes bad things happen when people are living a righteous life. That's the result of a fallen world that we live in. And then these people come along and they, they compound the issue like Bill Dad's doing by pushing this issue of repentance but it's not really needed in this case because Job, again, we keep saying he didn't do anything specifically to deserve this. So we didn't look at Proverbs this morning. There's a really good verse, Proverbs 9, 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Um, so many people out there they just lack understanding because they don't have the God piece in place either in their theology, which then affects what, how they minister to other people and so forth. You have people like Bill Dad, they just want to throw the book at someone like Job and emphasize these supposed hidden sins rather than compassionately coming alongside a friend and being there for them when they need it. 
I can't help but wonder, is Bildad playing sort of both sides of the fence? And what I mean, is he accusing Job of sin, but I wonder what kind of hidden sins in Bildad's life that he's not talking about here. Was he the one who actually needed to repent? That's a possibility. It's easy for people to be self-righteous when your own life isn't in the spotlight. So I talked about the need for knowledge and compassion and to strike a balance between the two. Um, this is how Bildad was right and wrong at the same time. And a lot of people say Christians are weak because people see compassion. Compassion and weakness are not the same thing. And it's unfortunate that people think of that. I would ask you, think about anybody in your life, uh, past or present, who uh, is just a very compassionate person. Does that person come off as weak to you? I would hope they wouldn't. Uh, oftentimes the strongest people are the compassionate people. Uh, they're, they're just, uh, they're rooted in God and they, they're rooted in the truth. Some of the most knowledgeable and compassionate people are just very confident people in what they know about God and they're strong as a result. So, you have people like uh, Bildad who don't understand that, maybe easily swayed, unprincipled, and maybe even people pleasers. But Job was a God pleaser. That's the difference. He spent every day with God. We learned that back in chapter one. Sometimes somebody needs a little bit of affirmation. Uh, they need that uh, to know that somebody else knows what it's like to walk a mile in their shoes, as they say. And Christians are in the minority in the world. We know that. But I know I take comfort in knowing that God's church, universal church, does its best work when it's in the minority position. We know that if we don't do it, somebody else might not either. So uh, that uh, responsibility falls on us. Uh, the message is for both men and women this morning. It doesn't matter who you are. Uh, we all serve God in our own special way. So I extend some encouragement to you as well as you go out into the world. Who knows what you're going to deal with? And again, maybe you're already in a situation like that where you know somebody who just needs compassion, but also needs to understand uh, what true repentance is as well. The bottom line is we have a duty to share with others the greatness of God as well as love, kindness, mercy, all those things that we read about in the scriptures. And if we don't do it, there's no guarantee for us that somebody else will. So that's a responsibility we carry with us. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, it boggles our minds to think of the great universe that you created and this one book said there were only over 3,600 planets, yet you created one for us, one perfect place to live. We thank you for that, God. Maybe there's some other place out there that might be able to sustain life. We just don't know of it yet. And when we think of millions and billions of stars and you created each one, it reminds us that you're so much greater than whatever things we're dealing with in our lives too. God, we pray that we would be knowledgeable about you. We pray that we would have a regular Bible reading routine, Bible study routine to understand you the best that we can. And also to have compassion at the same time. There's a time and a place to sort of throw the book at somebody and a time to demand repentance. And there's also a time to just be a shoulder to cry on and a, somebody, you know, lend an ear to somebody who needs it. God, it's a great responsibility to be a Christian believer, to be one of your children. But we thank you for that duty in our lives and for you calling us to that uh, duty as well. We thank you so much and praise you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.